Mother's Day weekend. Father's Day is not far away. The abortion issue is capturing headlines with lots of noise all around that full perspective. And it, it, it's caused me to be reflective of some things that God has put into my heart because of godly parents, not perfect parents, but godly parents. The two people who've made the most profound impact upon the development of my faith have been my parents. More than any professor, any school, any academic setting, any university. When I was young, my parents were not believers. And when they became Christians, there was profound change in their lives and in our home. And because of those changes, I eventually changed. I walked into the kitchen one day and said, what's happened to you? You're different. The temperature in our home had gone down by several factors. And they told me they'd ask Jesus to come live in their heart. And I said, well, I want to do that. And I knelt in the kitchen floor at 4811 Jackson Street in Hollywood, Florida, and asked Jesus to be Lord of my life. I was baptized a few weeks later in the Atlantic Ocean in Fort Lauderdale. So my spiritual formation didn't start in a church. It didn't start at the altar, and it didn't start in a traditional baptismal space. But I got to know the Lord. And there were some lessons that I took from my parents that are still speaking into my life today. And if you'll allow me, I'm going to just share a couple of those with you in this session. In fact, I'm going to ask you to act on them with me. I have little interest, almost no interest, in just sharing facts about our faith. I have a passion to see people awaken to a living Lord and to engage with him in the activities of their lives. We don't want to come just talk about our faith. We want to practice it. We want to live it out. We want to unleash it in our homes, in our communities, in our schools, and on the ball fields, and in the business offices. Amen. When I was seven, some of you know the story. Many of you have heard me tell portions of it. When I was seven, my mother went to the hospital to give birth to my youngest brother. And while she was there, she was diagnosed with cancer. And the doctors told her she had six months to live. This was the mid-60s. Treatments were very different than they are today. And they wanted to do some rather dramatic surgery. She had just had a C-section. And they wanted to do dramatic surgery the next day. And my parents hesitated on that and made arrangements to fly to Mayo Clinic. We attended church every Sunday. My parents were the youth leaders in the church we attended. It was the 60s. It was a large campus church. All the things that went with that in the 60s Time Magazine cover story said God is dead. And that idea didn't make it to Time Magazine without there being a lot of that sentiment in the church. You understand the culture reflects the vitality of the church. Jesus said the church is to be salt and light in the earth. It seems to me for too long we've been salt light. You'll, that'll, you'll catch up with that on the way home. You know, if you salt your food and you taste it and it doesn't taste salty, you don't say, well, I think the food must have diminished the taste of the salt. You say there's something wrong with the salt and you put more on. And if you dump the whole shaker out and it still doesn't taste salty, you want new salt, you're going to get rid of that. Well, our assignment is to be salt. And when the culture is drifting towards ungodliness, it's because the church is not being salt and light. The 60s was one of those seasons. There was rebellions in our streets and riots in our streets. This is not the first time we've seen this. We were throwing off the norms that had been a part of our, our society. Some needed adjusted, and some were just expressions of rebellion that we're reaping the harvest of today. Pastor came to visit my, my mother in the hospital, and he didn't believe in heaven or hell. So on the flight to Mayo Clinic, my mother said a prayer. They weren't Christians. And she prayed something like this. I, I really wasn't there, but it's been reported to me. That if there is a God before I die, let me know the truth so that I can tell my sons. And the expectation was the answer would be be Jewish or be Catholic or be Baptist because those were the expressions of religion that they were familiar with. They got to Mayo Clinic. They did a very thorough workup over a number of days. A doctor came in the room late at night, said, Mrs. Jackson, I don't have an ex explanation, but the masses and the tumors that were a part of your diagnosis when you came, we have the film and the blood work and all the information. We can't find them. Go home and raise your babies. My parents are here tonight, someplace. Stand up. Where are you at? They went inside. See? Fair weather Christians. 
I repent. That is not true. They're on a two-minute delay inside. I need to leave now, okay? <laughs> They're here, I promise. The mercy of God. You know, your, your vantage point on the, on the move of God really defines how you understand it. As far as I'm concerned, that was my miracle. I got to grow up with my birth mom. I'm certain to my father it was a miracle for him because he wasn't left with three little boys. I'm absolutely confident my mother knows she had a miracle because she's still here. Uh, the same would be said of my brothers. You know, where you stand in, in the, from perspective defines what, in so many ways what God is doing. It's why in community we're stronger. You listen to how one another sees what God is doing and, and we put our stories together and we find freedom and strength and adjustment and we're able to respond. Well, my mother asked to know the truth. God healed my mom when we were pagans. We were churched, but we were churched pagans. Did you know you can do that? You, sitting in church doesn't make you a Christ follower any more than sitting in the barn makes you a horse. It's just not true. We were pagans. That will fracture your theology. God didn't heal us because we prayed the right prayer or we believed the right things or we had done the right things. God showed his grace and mercy to my family in spite of us, not because of us. We moved to Miami Beach a few weeks later. My dad graduated from veterinary school at the University of Missouri. He wanted to be an equine practitioner. He wanted to work on horses. And we went to South Florida where the thoroughbred tracks were. And my mother was washing dishes. And she heard a voice through the ceiling, which was not normal. It said, you asked to know the truth before you died. And she said, yes, I did. And the voice said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. My mom didn't know where that was. She went and found a Bible and had to look it up and find it, and she read it. If you don't know, I'll give you a clue. It's John 14, 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. The Sunday school teacher in the church my parents were attending, the pastor in that church wasn't born again either. He didn't believe in the divinity of Jesus. This is not a new thing, folks. We've got to become more aware as consumers. We've got to be more alert. But the Sunday school teacher was an airline pilot and he was born again. My parents stopped by his house one Sunday after service. They left three boys in the car in South Florida. They put a little pan of water in the floor and they cracked a window. No, they didn't even do that. And they knelt at a coffee table at that airline pilot's in his living room and asked Jesus to be Lord of their lives. And my mother understood the answer to that prayer she had prayed, that the truth was not about a denomination, whether you needed to be Jewish or Baptist or Catholic or Methodist. It was about a person. His name was Jesus. And if there's been one lesson that I have taken from watching my parents and the influence of their lives in mine, it's to understand the truth begins with the person of Jesus. I like to learn. I could have been a professional student had God chosen to give me that assignment. I just like to learn. But the reality is the greatest truth you will ever know is centered in the person of Jesus and how you know him and how you interact with him, how you learn to hear his voice, how you learn to follow his direction, how you respond to him, the degree to which you're responsive to his prompts in your life, because Jesus of Nazareth is still very active in the earth today. He didn't ascend back to heaven and step away from us. He is still engaged with his people. And if we're more aware, if we are more cognizant of the alignment we have with a congregation or a denomination or a translation or a style of worship than we are of our alignment with Jesus, it's idolatry. We start with Jesus. The truth that defines our existence in time and for all eternity when we step out of time is the person of Jesus and how you know him. It isn't popular these days, but truth can be known. There is objective truth. The prevailing message of this season is that all truth is subjective, that you can't know my truth until you've walked in my shoes. And it's true. There's some things about my person that you couldn't know until you've shared some experiences that I have shared. But there is a truth that is not subjective. Subjective truth is personal, it's circumstantial, it's ever-changing, just as our lives and our circumstances are ever-changing. But objective truth is different. It is universal. 
It transcends our sex, our race, our nationality, our ethnicity, our economic status, our our educational accomplishments or lack thereof. There is some truth that is true of all humanity, no matter where we find ourselves on the planet, and it is knowable. Now, here's the challenge. The personal choice to believe or to reject reject that objective truth does not change the reality. This is very prevalent within the church. Uh, we'll, We'll say to one another, well, you know, I know what the Bible says, but let me tell you what I believe. Folks, if the Bible says it, adjust your belief. It's not always easy. It's not always straightforward. Sometimes we need the direction and the help of the Spirit of God and some wisdom. But begin to practice, cultivate the habit of subjecting yourself to the clear truth of the Word of God. It'll change your life. It's not a debate. When you read something and you're living apart from it, begin to say, Lord, help me. We're not the first generation of people who wear the label of God's people, and we're living far beyond the boundaries and the directions of Scripture. You know the story in the Old Testament? They lost their Bible. I don't mean they misplaced it in the house. They forgot they had one. It was used so infrequently, it was so insignificant, that a priest hid it in the wall of the temple. And nobody missed it. Sounds a lot like contemporary American culture, does it not? They tell me now that when I'm addressing groups that if the people are younger than 20 years old, they don't know biblical characters. They don't know who Jonah is or King David is. Well, they were remodeling the temple and they found the Torah scroll. They found the the, the books of the law, and they brought it to the king and began to read it to him. And when they read it, he tore his clothes in grief. And he said, my God, we're living so far away from this. We're not the first generation. There is truth, and you can know it. And to simplify it, let's begin with the truth around Jesus. Establish it in your heart. Stop beginning your faith journey by saying what you don't believe. Well, you know, I just don't know if I much believe in that or not. You know, I don't know. I've known people that believe like that, but I'm just not sure I believe like that. I don't know if I want to be one of those people or not. Folks, I intend to get caught in the midst of the people that believe. If it means I need to change, adjust, reflect, revisit, reconsider. Well, I knew somebody and they were, yeah, I know we've all known crazy people and they use Jesus' name every once in a while. But I've known people that did some pretty destructive things with food, but I haven't quit eating. I brought you the Apostles' Creed. I put it in your notes. I believe they can put it on the screens. It's such a great affirmation of a series of statements about Jesus. It's one of the oldest creedal statements. Before we had computers and before we had printing presses, we had to commit to memory the essential facts of our faith so that we wouldn't be swept aside by every wind of doctrine. The Apostles' Creed, many scholars think, goes back to the church in Jerusalem. Some suggest it was the baptismal confession for the early church in Jerusalem. So it's a, it's a collection of essential statements about our faith. You need it in your heart. Some of you grew up in a tradition where you said it weekly. Some of you have never seen it before. But all the statements are derived from Scripture. I'm going to ask you to say it with me out loud as a declaration of truth in your life. It begins with, I believe, and you could say every sentence in this creedal statement and begin it with, I believe. It's an affirmation of what you have decided, settled, established, made a foundation in your heart. If you're joining us digitally, you say this with us as well. Why don't you stand with me for this? I know you got your nest made, but just don't hit anybody with an umbrella. All right, we ready? Here we go. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
Amen. Hallelujah. You may have a seat. Now, if you're not familiar with the truth, you know his name. Begin to ask the Lord to give you a revelation of the truth. And don't ever deviate. If anybody comes to you and tells you that there's another way to salvation, another way to secure your future in eternity, that it's more important that you join this group or that group, or if anybody tells you their group is the only right group, you'll know that all of those voices are deceived. Jesus is the truth. And we don't begin with anything that supersedes him in our lives. Individually, collectively, corporately, if our nation is to see our freedom and liberties extended to the generations who follow this one, it will because we bow our knee to the truth. Not to opinion or parties or social movements or any other initiative. It will be because once again we turn our hearts to Jesus. There was a spiritual awakening in our nation before the American Revolution. And that moving of the Spirit of God in the colonies amongst those British citizens that were living across the ocean, that spiritual awakening gave them the moral resolve to stand up to the unfair treatment that was coming from the king. There was another spiritual awakening in our nation prior to the Civil War. It moved across our nation. It was significant. It, 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 it reached across social boundaries and denominational boundaries and all those things that separate us. And it gave us the moral courage to say that slavery was an evil and if we had to shed our blood to end it, we would. We need a spiritual awakening. We need a spiritual awakening. There's a second lesson I want to share with you and the last lesson I want to share with you in this particular session. It's a part of that same story. My mother's prayer, if there's a God, let him know the truth before I die. My mom was expecting a revelation of be a Baptist or be Jewish. I don't think she really expected the doctors to give her a good report. We weren't a people who knew about miracles. We didn't know other people who had miracles. We didn't believe in healing. They didn't talk about that in the church we attended. It may have been a part of the liturgy. It may have been a part of our history, but it certainly wasn't a part of our experience. We simply had no experience, so there was no expectation. The people you spend your discretionary time with shape your expectations. They'll shape your expectations about how to vacation or how to use your recreational time or they'll shape your expectations to be a person who trusts God more fully. Consider who you spend your discretionary time with. We had no imagination of that. So when the doctors came in and said, we can't find the cancer, there were no words. There was no explanation. We couldn't really say the diagnosis was blown because there was a clear diagnostic trail. There had been months of symptoms. There, there was, it wasn't some bizarre change of events. It was, we were standing in one reality one day and another reality the other day. So I want to spend the balance of our time talking about a lesson that I was introduced to as a boy, but I've lived with for all the intervening years, and it's been a few. And that's that God heals. God heals. Our God is a healer. It's a part of the story. Don't get quiet on me. Jesus was a healer. In our Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation, the power of God is transcendent over a human life. Whether he translates Philip from a baptismal pool in the desert to someplace else, or Jesus steps back into time to snatch the Saul of Tarsus by the back of the neck on the Damascus Road, or the Spirit of God falls upon the disciples in Acts chapter 2 and thousands of people give their hearts to Jesus in the city, our God is a miracle-working God. And we act as if we become a bit too sophisticated, a bit too educated, a bit too polished, a bit too suave. I grew up in the South, a bit swavy. <laughs> we want to pretend, you know, like now that we're, we've intellectualized our faith and we no longer have to depend upon the power of God. Really, have you looked at our world lately? Folks, there is no solution for us other than the power of God. And if the church doesn't believe in the power of God and know how to invite it into our lives and to cooperate with the Spirit of God more fully, where do we think that's going to come from? So I want to take a moment or two with this idea that our God heals. People ask me frequently if I believe in God or medicine. Do I believe in miracles or doctors? And I always answer the same way. Yes. 
Absolutely I do. I'm grateful for doctors and hospitals and medical training and all that the scientific method has brought to bear and those individuals who've sacrificed years of their lives training and preparing themselves while others were out having a good time. Stop being angry at people that have flourished in the medical profession. The overwhelming majority of them have sacrificed to train and learn to help the rest of us. Don't let some knucklehead make you jealous or envious and angry at somebody who's blessed. I'm tired of that type of division. On the other hand, God's not a scientist. He's not opposed to science. Science does not negate God. The more we learn, the more we understand the world we live in, the more God becomes the obvious conclusion. But please don't imagine this false dichotomy, this false separation that you either have to believe in divine healing or medicine. Because if I go to the doctor, I pray before I make the appointment. I pray on the way to the appointment. I'll pray when I leave the appointment. I'll pray before I take the prescription that may have been given to me. I want an outcome that causes the doctor to go, wow, I never expected that. And if you have a miracle, don't go to the doctor and ask them to affirm it. They have to put everything into a computer that the insurance company will sign off on. There is not a box for miracle. So don't ask them to affirm it. It's an unfair request. Simply establish in your heart that God has done what only God can do. But God hasn't stopped doing miracles. It wasn't the scientists that first said God stopped doing miracles. It was the church. Because inviting people towards prayer and inviting people towards the supernatural is a messy business. It's a little uncomfortable. It's a little sloppy. God intervenes in the life of some family of pagans like mine. And then there's some godly family that loves him. And it seems that the miracle that they have so desperately asked for doesn't arrive. And it's hard to respond to that. It's often hard to understand. And so rather than wrestle with it and grapple with it and continue to invite people into the presence of God, we just step away from it altogether. Folks, not everyone that goes to the doctor gets a good outcome. You know what they call the people who who work in the medical profession? You know what they call the pursuit of their occupation? Practice. They're just practicing on you. It worked pretty well yesterday. Last week that didn't work too well, but I'm going to try real hard with you. If I keep practicing, but in our arrogance and pride and and religious sense of self-righteousness, we want a certainty. I'm not praying for anybody until I know everybody will get whatever. Oh, baloney, stop it. You lead two people to the Lord, and one person makes a 170 degree life change in a 24 hour window of time and the other person continues on. We don't understand always what God is doing and how he's doing it and when he's going to do it, but we want to keep inviting him into the midst of our lives. Amen? I'll just give you some simple things. Miracles, healings in the, in the scripture, particularly in the New Testament, are intended as a testimony and a sign to unbelievers. Our faith is about God's power, not about our organizational prowess. We're not going to out-organize the devil. We need a power greater than evil to be on display in our world, and God intends that to come through his church. That's us. So yes, I will pray for people. Well, what happens if nothing happens? We'll pray again. Well, what if you don't get the answer you wanted? I'm going to keep learning. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul is talking to a church. When I came to you, I didn't come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. However long he was in Corinth, he only had one theme. What are you going to talk about tomorrow? Jesus and his crucifixion. You talked about that yesterday. Yep. What are you going to talk about next week? Jesus and his crucifixion. Well, I heard that this week and last week. Uh Uh-huh. Watch the next statement. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. Are you ready to minister in that way? You say, well, I feel so weak and I'm a little frightened and I'm anxious about it. You and the Apostle Paul. You're not different. He didn't say, I got this. 
Christians that feel competent make me nervous. I'm much more comfortable with people who feel inadequate because we recognize that in our lack of adequacy, that we are totally dependent upon the help and the mercy and the power of God. When you think you've figured out how to get God to move, get down on your face and say, God, I'm sorry, forgive me of my pride. Paul said, I came in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. May I humbly submit our world is waiting for a demonstration of the power of God. We've been praying for months and months now, for more than two years, that the truth would be told in the public square. And we see it happening week after week after week. It's not coming in the timetable that we wanted. It would have been more convenient if some of the truth would have been told 18 months ago, but it wasn't told then, but it's being told now. Are you celebrating? Are you thanking the Lord? Are you worshiping him? I would have preferred the Supreme Court had a decision about the sanctity of human life a couple of decades ago. We'd have saved millions of children. But I'm encouraged that they may be awakening to that reality these days. It's not going to be easy or comfortable. We're going to have to learn to minister with grace and mercy and power because there's an enormous amount of guilt and shame. An enormous amount of guilt and shame. Not outside the church, in the church. It's why we've been so quiet. We need a demonstration of the power of God. In Luke 5, they brought a man for Jesus to minister to. And Jesus, in his wisdom, looked at the young man. He was paralyzed. But he began with his spiritual condition, and he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus knew that if his spiritual condition was resolved, whatever physical challenges he had were secondary. See, we've become so worldly, so carnal within the church, we don't have that imagination. We think if we've said the sinner's prayer and been dipped in a pool, we don't have any more spiritual needs. We're just almost totally resentful, totally close to the idea that we could need spiritual freedom beyond a conversion. We live with this goofy notion that we got it all. Where'd we hide it if we got it all? I mean, we certainly have a legal access to it all, but we're not living in the total freedom of the redemptive work of Jesus. And Jesus looks at this young man and said, your sins are forgiven. And the people listening to him, some of them were offended. Who do you think you are? Just who do you think you are to forgive sins? And Jesus knew what they were thinking. Did you know that Jesus knows what you think? We've got this remarkable attitude that if you can fool the pastor, you've gotten away with it. (laughs) News alert. The creator of all things is more clever than pastor. And he knows the thoughts and intents of my heart and yours. Don't be frightened by that. He knows when you intend to do the right thing, even when it doesn't work out. It's not a threat. It's an opportunity. But watch the end of this. It's Luke 5. Jesus knew what they were thinking, and he said, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But that you may know the Son of God has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And immediately stood up in front of them. He used the miracle of healing to affirm the authority he had to forgive sins. You see, if our world sees a demonstration of the power of God, they'll be far more receptive to your messaging and your discussion and your conversation with them around how to live their lives. Not everybody. Some people will take the miracles of God and continue in their ungodliness. It's not a new thing. But the power of God on display is a part of what is in front of us, and it begins with a change in our hearts. God is not less interested in helping people We have to become more interested in being the conduit for what God wants to do. I would submit to you, secondly, that for the believer, growing up in faith is about understanding the redemptive work of Jesus. You see, as we grow up in our faith, as we move beyond the infancy of the new birth and that conversion experience, we learn that not only have our sins been forgiven, but we've been justified, sanctified, that God's power is present within us to do things we cannot do ourselves. 
We haven't been interested. It hasn't really mattered that much to us. There's a statement in Ephesians 4. And if we're going to talk about the supernatural and praying for other people, this is an important component of the recipe. Do not give the devil a foothold. Don't lead sloppy lives. Don't, co don't compromise willingly. Don't practice ungodliness. We all face temptation. We all face um, invitations to wrong behaviors. or We're all confronted with wrong thoughts. Wrong thoughts are presented to every one of us. It doesn't make you a sinner to have a wrong thought. But you can dismiss the thought as readily as it arrives. But we cannot afford to lead lives where we willingly, intentionally, purposefully deviate from the truth that we know. You just can't do that. Oh, I know we've been doing it. But look at the fine mess we've gotten ourselves in, Ali. We've got to change our pattern. We need a new cadence, a new rhythm, a new response to life. Well, I've prospered. I have a good life. I eat well. My kids are doing well. Folks, you're talking to me about things that can disappear overnight. Only God can secure our futures. Do not give the devil a foothold. It's not my imagination. Ephesians 4, Paul's writing to a church. He said, each one of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. We're all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who's been stealing must steal no longer. Did you know the people that come to church steal? Look at the person on your right. Now check out the one on your left. What do you think? <laughs> he who's been stealing must steal no longer, but he must work. Oh. You know, we're looking for the 30-hour work week. And we'd like somebody else to work 27 of our hours. Doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not give the devil a foothold in its larger context. I don't have that, I won't take the time. There's seven things there that are identified specifically about not giving the devil a foothold. Be truthful, not deceptive. No grudges, no anger, no resentment, no stealing, work. Practice generosity, no sexual immorality. That means sexual activity is combined within the context of your marriage. Not before it, not beyond it. It's immoral. You cannot expect the blessings of God and to ignore his boundaries. And you can't sponsor it. It's not enough to abstain yourself. If you're sponsoring it, you're a participant. We've got to become more honest with ourselves. No greed, no disobedience. Do not give the devil a foothold. We're talking about inviting the supernatural power of God into the midst of his people. We need to see it in a new way, in a more prevalent way, in a more consistent way. And we've got to be willing to say no to ungodliness in a more determined way. Now, because I believe in healing, or you believe in healing, we need to acknowledge that aging is not suspended. The belief in divine healing is not the cure for birthdays. Don't be goofy. I've done this so long. I've, I've met so many people. Folks, you've heard me say, if you're out of gas, you don't need a miracle. You need a filling station and a bank loan. If you have a test tomorrow when you're in school... You don't need to pray for a miracle. You need some good old-fashioned study time. Being a person of faith does not suspend you from the rules, the laws of the world that we live in. And it's not, an, it's not going to suspend your aging process. Praying for one another is grounded in Scripture. In Genesis 1.31, God saw all he'd made and it was very good. He didn't look at Adam and Eve and go, oops. Let's try that one again. Psalm 103, verse 2, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Isaiah 53 is the messianic prophecy in Isaiah. 
Speaking of Messiah, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his words we are healed. I was having a conversation about that messianic passage with a, a spiritual leader one day, and they said, well, Pastor, that's just spiritual healing. And then I read Matthew 8. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to Jesus, and he drove out the spirits with a word, and he healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. Thank God Jesus didn't talk to my friend. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. I could give you dozens and dozens and dozens of scriptures. A significant part of Jesus' public ministry was casting out unclean spirits and ministering to the sick. And oftentimes their, their healing was intertwined. We've got to be awakened to the power of God. It changed my life when I was a boy, and it's changed my life in every season from that date until this one. So this isn't theoretical to me. If you ask me what I believe God can do, I'll tell you God can, and you can fill in the blank after that. Now, for full disclosure, I have done memorial services for friends of mine who I felt left far too early. There's a great deal I don't know, and I wouldn't pretend to. But I'm telling you, you can establish for yourself that our God is a healer. Begin to build it into the foundation of your own personal story. In fact, I want to close this session with you by praying for those who have a need. If you're here and you need physical healing, I'm just going to ask you to stand wherever you are. If you're inside in one of the sanctuaries, if you're at home, you can stand right there. I'm not going to take long with this. I want to hear the Isaacs. And I, I, to be honest, the Lord will minister to you while they sing. Please don't sit here and ask them to entertain you. You sit there and welcome the Spirit of the Lord. He'll minister to you far beyond the appointed time for a prayer. If you need a, if you need a physical healing, I'm going to ask you to stand. Okay, Anybody else? We're going to move. Now, I want to add one thing to that. And I need you to be respectful, so please give me your attention for just a moment. See, I don't believe what, we, what is ahead of us is going to be about me praying for more sick people and seeing more miracles. I believe it's going to be more about you praying for people and seeing more miracles. So if you're seated near one of these people who has stood up, I'm going to ask you, just two or three of you who are around them, don't scare them. And I, please listen. I'm going to ask you to step over and introduce yourself. And if they grant you permission, simply to put a hand on their shoulder. Nothing but their shoulder. And if they don't give you permission, don't touch them. If somebody touches you without permission and tell it, without telling you their name, ask them to step away. All right, you with me? So if you're next to one of those people, a couple of you, just step up. Introduce yourself. I don't want strangers touching me. And I'm not being funny. I mean that. We're going to pray for one another. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for your word, for its truth and authority and power in our lives. I thank you for our Lord Jesus, that he offered himself as a sacrifice, that we might be forgiven of our sins, that we might be delivered from all the power of the enemy. And we come tonight to pray for one another. Lord, you know every detail. You know every diagnosis, every circumstance. Lord, you know the, the things that have been said to us and over us. And now we pray for one another and we ask in Jesus' name that you would bring life to our mortal bodies. Bring health to us and strength to us and energy to us. Where there has been unhealthy tissue, may it wither and die. Lord, where our body hasn't been functioning as it should, I pray that the healing that you designed within us will supersede any disease process. Bring life to us and strength and vitality. We praise you for it as we pray for one another. May the sickness go. May the symptoms yield. May life come to us. May the doctors and nurses and those caring for us have wisdom beyond themselves. 
May the treatments they have prescribed be effective beyond what any imagination would have held. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. That our bones will be strong. That our backs will be pain free. That we'll be set free from every attack of the enemy. In Jesus name, amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson.